Scottish foods. Oh, this one caused some hoopla in the state, didn't it? And still is. Uh, 65th Legislative Assembly last year. It came through as a law that went into effect August 1st of 2017, last August. Um, cottage food operators were covered under this law. Um, do not, cottage food operators, do not require an approved licensed kitchen or inspection. That's basically what it boiled down to. Some of the major changes, uniformity across local jurisdictions, we'll talk about that in a minute. Transportation and delivery of products off the farm and outside of farmers markets and farm stands, including craft shows, community events, and fairs. Um, that was important because before, the, the regulations always pretty much said, you know, you have to sell this on your farm or you have to sell it at a farmer's market. If you're at a craft show, that don't count. If you're at a trade show, that don't count. Well, now those things are also considered cottage foods events. So that was kind of um, a big deal too. Refrigerated baked goods that require temperature control for safety are allowed for sale if transported and maintained frozen. Bearing safe handling instructions. We'll go through that as well. But that was another major deal because I'm sure we've all been to the farmer's market and seen the cooking sitting on the table, 102 degrees, right? Okay, and not just cooking. I, I don't want to pick on cooking. Pumpkin pie. Those things need to be sold frozen now, okay? Um, last two major changes, poultry under a thousand uh, bird exemption. Um, which that number used to be different, so now we can do up to a thousand. And also, um, eggs and poultry now say poultry or eggs. It used to just say chickens. But we have so many people doing ducks and duck eggs, and um, you know, my sister does quail eggs, and you know, so it now says poultry, where it used to just say chickens. So those are some of the major changes. Um, if I know most of you have been doing this for a while, so you kind of understood. These are all of the different health districts we have in North Dakota. There are 36 different health districts. Um, and until this went into place, all 36 kind of had their own interpretation of what was legal, what was right, and what could be sold, and what couldn't. So it really depended on where you were, what rules and regulations you needed to follow, which made it pretty tough for places like the Farmtastic Food Hub, which is located in Pierce County. There to sell to over here and down to here and over to here because they had a whole bunch of different sets of rules that they would have needed to follow. Or, like me, I'm located here, but we sell, oh, it's a smart word, don't touch. <laughs> We're located here, but we sell here, <coughs> mm, excuse me, here, 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 here over here in Minnesota, up here in Cavalier, oh, and here in Ramsey. Lots of different districts. So if nothing else came out of this cottage foods law, the fact that we now have some uniformity across the state, everybody's playing by the same rules, the same definitions, the same understanding, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. This actually, I'm doing eight of these sessions around the state. This is the first one that I have not had a State Department of Health person and a local health person at the workshop. It just so happened that Mike Lee was busy this weekend and Julie was busy this weekend and it just didn't work out for him. But every other one, they've been there. And um, it's been really good to, to have them all on the same page with the producers. Um, it's, it's been phenomenal. So, this is kind of how it went. Um, July to August of last year, there were work group meetings. August 1st, um, a website went up, a memo was published talking about the new law and some guidance document. January of 2018, there were some draft and proposed rules that came out. Um, because in North Dakota, when something becomes a law, then we have to draw up administrative rules and decide how are we going to enforce that law? You know, um, yes, it's a law, yes, it goes into effect, but we have to decide how we're going to enforce it, right? So those proposed rules are considered administrative rules, and we started um, 
with a work group of us. I was part of that, as were many of the local and state health district people, and a lot of other producers. I was not the only one that were on that work group. Coming up with some proposed ways on how we, this was going to be enforced. Now, um, then they advertise notice of intent on those proposed rules and ask for public comment. And that went out February 15th to April 4th. March, there were scheduled hearings, March 22nd and March 23rd, that were supposed to be held in person. And all of a sudden, I think it was about March 20th, my email blew up. They canceled the public hearings. They canceled the open public comment time. They took everything down off the website and said, we're backing off. Which is kind of a good thing because remember those 12 pages that we marked out of here and we put guidance, not rule? That's what they were trying to say we want to enforce. Those 12 pages at that time was what they were trying to say we want to make law. What happened was some of the people that introduced that cottage food bill and the legislators that brought it forward and the legislators that voted on it went back to the State Department of Health and said, this was not our intent. Our intent was to simplify things, not make 12 pages of regulations that people need to follow. So the Department of Health pulled back everything they had done, and they said, all right, we're going to follow the letter of the law. Exactly what you, as legislators, and the people that helped you write this passed as law that's what we're going to do. So the other handout that you were given says chapter 23-09.5. That is the law. This is what will be enforced as it is written. And the role that the North Dakota State Department of Health will take in all of this is merely education. If somebody needs to be educated about how to make things safer, they are there to help you and enforcement. If someone gets sick, they, by law, have the right to do an investigation to figure out you know, what happened, where it happened, do any recalls, so that more people don't get sick. And that, and that makes perfect sense. So we're going to kind of go through the law and their interpretation of it. Um, as we go through this, what I've tried to do on these slides is if it has a red um, title at the top, that's part of the law. That's, that's a must follow, must do. If it has a black title, that's a guideline. That's a, a should do, good thing to do. Okay? So as we go through, that's what we can look for. Cottage Foods Operator is an individual who produces or packages cottage food products in a kitchen designed and intended for use by the residents of a private home. Um, before we get too far into this, again, I want to state, if all you do is fresh, raw, uncut produce, you're good. You don't have to worry about really any of this. Federal or state, fresh, raw, uncut produce is allowed and allowable under federal and state. Okay? So it's only when you start to cut up the melons or um, give away samples or make it into jelly, or any of those things. Pro make it into salsa, okay? That you be could become a cottage food operator. Cottage food operator means that you are making that food in a kitchen that is your home kitchen. It's a design for home use in a private home. A cottage food product can be anything from a baked good, jam, jelly, other food and drink products produced by the cottage foods operator. So if you make it, it's a cottage food. Informed end consumer is a big part of this law. So what is an informed end consumer? It means an individual who is the last individual to purchase a cottage food product and has been informed the cottage food product is not licensed, regulated, or inspected. Uh, informed end consumer, as I said, is really a big part of this law. The intent of this law is to give some entrepreneurial advantages or to give some leeway to those people that are selling direct to consumer. 
This is not intended for the person that is making uh, wedding cakes in their home kitchen. Because that wedding cake is going out and being fed to 200 people. Right? This is intended for those people that are selling what you grew or what you produce or what you bathed or whatever directly to the person that's going to eat it. Or the person in their family that's going to eat it. Right? Think about it this way. The whole intent of all of this is to allow um, some flexibility and to give the consumer, the informed and consumer choices, but at the same time make sure that we're not out there making two, three hundred people sick, right? You're not going to make your own potato salad in your kitchen and then sell it to a big local event. This is an informed and consumer. The, the individual to purchase it is the last individual to purchase it and then eat it, okay? Um, what you do want to do uh, is, in the book, remember, this product is made in a home kitchen that is not inspected by the state or local health department. Again, this does not apply to fresh, whole produce, but if you are making salsa, jams, jellies, pickles, whatever you're making, this is the wording on the sign that you want to have at your farmer's market booth um, or that you want to have on your product. There's nothing in the law that says you need to have one of those labels on every jar of jelly or every you know, thing that you sell, every package of funds or rolls. But you would want to have this at least if you're selling from your farm, you know, a, a sign like that on your farm. If you're selling at the farmer's market, you want one on, on your farmer's market booth. Uh, except for whole unprocessed fruits and vegetables. Foods prepared by a cottage food operator may not be sold or used in any food establishment, food processing plant, or food store, or any other venue prohibited by law. So what this part of the law is saying is, you need to be selling to that individual. You can't sell your stuff to a school, you can't sell it to a restaurant or a grocery store or a nursing home or any place else where they're going to take it and feed a whole bunch of other people. This is face-to-face, -face, individual, direct-to-consumer sales. A transaction. This was also something that was kind of a bone of contention before the law went through, is when does the sale take place? We started seeing a lot of things on Facebook. People were like, oh, I'm making jelly, you know, I want to sell my jelly, and then it'd show up on Facebook and stuff. Um, we see a lot of people with websites, a lot of farmers and producers with websites selling things that way. So what they came back and said, a transaction is the exchange of buying and selling. Direct producer to consumer sales, in that a transaction must occur direct, in person, and face to face between the cottage food operator, the person that made it, and the informed end consumer at the point of sale or point of purchase. So you can advertise on Facebook, you can advertise on your website. What you can't do is take the money over your website. You can't use PayPal to take their money and then ship them their jelly or whatever. You have to see that person face to face. Point of sale or point of purchase does not include use of online streaming or social media websites for the intent of advertising, provided these methods are not used to serve as a means for electronic transactions. Product may not be mailed, sold on the internet, delivered, or transported over state lines. So again, this cottage food law only applies to anything you want to make. Go ahead and make it, as long as you are the person that delivers it and receives payment face-to-face -face with the person that's buying. Um, do cottage food products require labeling? No, no special labeling. The only exception is the label requirement for refrigerated baked goods in regards to safe handling instructions. Going back to those baked goods like the pies, um, they need to have safe handling instructions on them. Thaw, bake for 45 minutes until done, whatever, whatever, okay? So if you're selling uh, pies that need, or baked goods of any kind that need time and temperature control, they, these, these are, you think of it and go, is this the kind of pie I would normally take a slice and then put it in the fridge, right? Or I'd store this in the fridge. Then those types of items need to be sold frozen 
and they need to have a sticker on them that talk about safe handling instructions. Um, refrigerated home baked goods, which require time and temperature record. Here's your example. Products must remain frozen until thawed under refrigeration at 41 degrees or less and are for immediate consumption or discarded within seven days after the body. There's your example. Things that are not approved for sale, things that uh, you couldn't sell them before, you still can't sell them, they are not allowed, even according to our new law, is meat or meat products. Um, there was a lot of hope when this first went through. It's like, woohoo, you know, because I because I can do chickens, I can do up to a thousand birds, right? That's that part of this that changed. I can now do, I can now sell chicken noodle soup. No, you can't. Because yes, you can do up to a thousand birds, but they must be sold whole and frozen. And to make that chicken soup, you gotta cut them up, right? So that's where meat products are not allowed. Other meat or meat products are not allowed. So no jerky, no chicken soup, no beef barley soup. Limitations of sales, food establishments, which meaning restaurants, coffee shop, cafeterias, all of those things, bakery, grocery store, meat market, um, cannot purchase cottage foods. Food processing plants is considered a commercial operation that manufactures products, labels of stores, food for human consumption, and does not provide food directly to the consumer. Again, you can't sell your salsa to a manufacturing plant who's then going to put your salsa in a taco kit or something, right? Um, but keep in mind, whole, uncut produce does it, it, that doesn't count here. You can sell whole uncut produce to processing plants. We're talking processed food items, okay? Retail food stores, any establishment or section um, where food and food products are offered to the consumer and intended for off-premise consumption. And that includes convenience stores and gas stations. And why did they need to add those? Because many of our rural convenience stores and gas stations have that little section, don't they? My local convenience store sells baked goods from a local cottage food producer, at least they used to. So those are places where you can't sell them. And why? Because you, as the cottage food producer, are not the one standing there taking the money from the informed end consumer. That's what it all goes back to, is that transaction. Okay. Complaint investigation, the North Dakota Department of Health will be the one to investigate complaints. The steps to an investigation are they need to receive the complaint. Someone needs to call them, a hospital, emergency room, whoever, and say, we have a sick person here. Or I went to the doctor, an individual, I went to the doctor and I got sick and they said it was food poisoning. And then the State Department of Health will go back to that person or doctor, hospital, clinic, and say, okay, let's figure out what, what all did this person eat? Where did they eat? What did they eat? Where was it? And was it their fault? Did they buy something that was totally legal and totally fine and then they took it home and they left it on the counter for three days and then they had some? They'll do that investigation as well. And check things back. Um, once they figure out the source, their main goal is to correct so that it doesn't happen again. They're not gonna come storming in and close you down and all of that. Education is going to be their main goal. Um, now we get into just the guidance. Everything from here on out, we've pretty much covered what is the law. Any questions on that? On what actually the law says? Um, from my other sessions, I can tell you the questions that we have covered. Um, they asked about samples, where we used to be pretty, um, pretty careful about not doing samples in the past, right? Um, the answer to that from the State Department of Health was, we can't do anything about samples. 
If you want to sample your product, go ahead and sample your product. But the best thing that we can do is say, please try and do it safely. You know, use toothpicks or tongs or, you know, do, do that sampling safely. Um, but as long as it's between you and the informed end consumer, that's a kind of truth. I'm trying to think of what other questions we had. In the past, um, beverages were not allowed. Beverages are not allowed. Um, so if you want to make a raspberry water and sell it, then you can sell raspberry water. But again, the Department of Health is saying, please use some common sense. Make sure you're using potable water, that your water has been tested, and you know that there's not E. coli in your water, and you're not gonna make people sick that way. That if you're using ice, you purchase ice. Or if you're making your own ice, you need to have your ice inspected, because ice machines are one of the dirtiest things out there. They're terrible. Um, you know, so they're just saying, yeah, it's allowed now, but, Let's use some, some good thinking. So like last year at the farmer's market here in town, we had some kids and um, parents come and they sold like lemonade and stuff. So that's acceptable? Yeah. Okay. Again, we want to make sure. I mean, the best in, if they're selling it here in town, best case scenario, they're using city water and ice that they purchased to make it. Hopefully. Is cheese balls and flavored butter approved um, to sell at market now? Yes. As long as it's cottage food. From but it has to be kept frozen. Does it have to be kept frozen or because that's probably not a... It is not spelled out in the law. So it can this be kept is, as long as this it's This is what's legal. And so... Even the, the law doesn't even say that it needs to be kept at 41 degrees. That's good practicing, good handling instructions. You don't want your butter, butter turning into a puddle right there to your market stand, right? But as long as you are making it, selling it direct to the end consumer, so you have that informant consumer and a cottage foods operator, it, it is legal. I don't know Um, there is, I thought there was one thing in here though that they gave, it wasn't butter. Maybe I'm thinking of the guidance. Yeah, I'm thinking of the guidance. Yeah, because this is the law right here. So when somebody asks you, oh, can we sell flavored butters? Never used to be able to sell flavored oils either. So you could do flavored vinegars, but you couldn't do flavored oils. If I have a huge cabbage, I can cut the sucker in half and sell it to you and Somebody else? Then you speak. No taxes involved, no nothing. Um, in the okay, good question, and I do have that slide, but since you asked the question, um, taxes come into play with ready to eat foods. I highly doubt that somebody is going to take that half a cabbage and just start munching on it right there at the market. So um, Say you have somebody at the market. Watermelon. <laughs> exactly. If you're selling slices of watermelon, that and, and you put a napkin with it and a thing of salt, that's ready to eat. You you better be taxing that baby. Exactly. Right. But if you have a big watermelon and you chop it in half, you say you can two ways. Buy the half. I would say oh. yes. That is not considered ready to eat. They've got to take it home. Think. I know. Yeah. It, it's. <laughs> Perception, there's a lot of gray area. And you know, and that's how that guidance document got to be 12 pages long. It's because we started talking about the, you know, well, what if? Or um, we have producers that sell jalapeno cheese bread at the market. That was a big one, you know? Um, they said, oh no, because now the bread has um, vegetables in it and the water reactivity content is going to go up and it's not going to be shelf stable anymore and blah 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 and we said okay so they wrote it in there and it said um, baked goods may not uh, contain uh, vegetables and I said well does that take out pumpkin bread zucchini bread and banana bread and you know all those other things because those are really vegetables and fruits right um, so it quickly got paired back and we're now back to this this is it, this is the law. 
And there's nothing in here that says anything about flavored butters not being allowed. It doesn't even say you need to keep flavored butters at 41 degrees. Is that best practice and good guidance? Absolutely. And, and if you care about your own behind and liability and your product and your customers, you're going to keep it at 41 degrees, right? Um, or, or, or sell it frozen. Um, but there's nothing in the law that says you have to. That's why I tried to make the, the red and the black headings so that it was really clear. There's a difference between the law and just really good common sense. There's one item that uh, I've seen a lot of discussion and conflict over in our markets, and uh, we don't do it, but it's left some. I mean, we've had people say, no, you can't sell that, and they had to stop selling it. And, I mean, they had it frozen, but, and some was unfrozen, but. They can sell left some. It's considered, it is considered a baked good, just like a loaf of bread. It is fully baked, it's not par-baked. Go ahead, sell the left side. There's nothing that says uh, it, it needs to be frozen or kept cold or anything. Any other things you can think of at the market that were questions or questionable? Or... I've got a spreadsheet three pages long. I had, it, I had a market call me week before last and say, is there anything in any of the rules or regulations that sell, say you can't sell worms? No worms. Worm. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah. Red wigglers, you know. I'm like, no, there's, there's nothing. That, I don't know if they were going for, for, since it was red wigglers, I'm guessing for compost, for putting in your compost pile and decomposing your, your compost pile. Yeah. Um, so. Tequila. However, there are, yes, there are FDA laws against the tequila. The, the, the booze we still can't do. Okay, so now we're into the guidance. We've covered the law. We're into just basic, good, common sense. This is what you should do, not what you must do. And so when we're talking about basic, good, common sense, and we, we use the term homemade, um, we're talking about anything, home processed, home canned, home baked, home packaged, any of that prepared in a cottage food operator's home or kitchen. That's when we say homemade, that's what we're talking about. Home canned um, means fruits or vegetables processed in North Dakota using a boiling water uh, canner where the product does not require temperature control for safety. So all of your GMs and jellies, those are water baths, right? Um, homemade canned products do not include products containing dairy, meat, wild game, poultry, fish, or seafood. Because remember when we were doing the, the law, meat and meat products are not allowed. The recommendation for home canned products is that you use a standard recipe. In other words, we, we know we all want to use great grandma's pickle recipe because it is the best pickles we've ever tasted. But good practices say use a standard recipe. Um, where do you find a standard recipe? The Ball Blue Books um, are great guides. The United States Department of Agriculture Complete Guide to Home Canning has a whole bunch of recipes. Um, the National Center for Home Pres Food Preservation has a bunch of recipes. Many university extension stations uh, all across the United States put out recipes. Um, if it's from them, you can pretty much be sure that it, it has been tested and it, it follows the regulations. However, if you still want to use Great Grandma's Pickle Recipe, because it's still the best pickle recipe you've ever had, what you want to do is home test it using a calibrated pH meter or get your recipe tested. So let's cover A first. How do you get your recipe tested? Um, NDSU, Clifford Hall, Dr. Clifford Hall, and Julie Garden Robinson. Um, both do testing. And what you do is you, you send them your recipe and you send them a, a jar of, of your great grandma's pickles, right? And they will put it through all sorts of tests to make sure that your process and your end product are safe. Now, the other thing that you can do is, is test it yourself. So why would you want to send it to MDSU? And because there will be a fee that goes along with that. I, I currently don't know the, the fee, but there will be a fee that goes along with that. Why would you want to go that extra step? 
go the extra step if this is something, hey, I'm just testing it out at the farmer's market, but my goal, my business goal, is to be the next Dots Pretzels or the next, you know, whatever. I'm going to turn this into a much bigger um, commercial operation. That's when you'd want to have it tested, right? Or you're just doing tons of them. You're going great guns. You sell 400 jars of these every year, okay? Then you may want to have it tested. The cost is worth it. But if you're not, home testing and calibration. Um, I talk about that a little bit later. I've got a picture. So I, I so we're gonna talk about that later. Home process dry goods that do not require temperature control for safety, such as hauled or unhauled seeds, dried herbs, grains, flour. We've got a lot of people doing flour now, seasoning mixes, granola, popcorn, all of those things are allowed. Honey produced in North Dakota, allowed. Um, if you have your own hives and, and you want to you know, collect and sell your own honey, that's fine. No regulation, no uh, anything like that. However, if you have your own hives, know that you have to register those hives with the Department of Agriculture. There's just a very small fee, fill out a very quick little form, and that's uh, a hive of any size if you are running your own hive. Non-alcoholics, sorry, please. Uh, Non-alcoholic beverages and other drink products such as dry mix lemonade, black coffee, brew tea produced in North Dakota that do not require temperature control for safety are all fine to sell. Home baked goods, um, food produced in North Dakota from dough or batter that is baked before consuming. Um, we talked about those things requiring temperature control for safety, cooking, cheesecake, pumpkin pie, shall be maintained frozen. All of those, which, you know, I think is kind of silly. I'm a producer. I have 150 extra pumpkins. I can't sell them at market. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna make them into pumpkin pies and sell them as fresh pumpkin pies. But I can't do that because I now have to make my fresh pumpkin pies and freeze them and sell them frozen. Um, but that part actually is law. They need to be sold frozen. Um, She'll be fully baked and not partially baked and are ready to eat once thawed. Raw home baked goods such as cookie dough or bread dough requiring temperature control for safety shall be maintained frozen. So that's another one that needs to be frozen. Ready to eat home baked goods that do not require temperature control for safety such as bread, cookies, biscuits, um, all need to be fully baked. So don't like par bake them. One of the things that comes to mind for me that fits somewhere in the middle on this one is we have uh, Pretzers in rugby. Their, one of their best selling products, one of them, is a pizza crust, yeah? And that pizza crust is par baked, isn't it? It's not fully baked, it's not fully cooked, it's just par cooked. Um, but they always sell them frozen. So, and with the, the little label on it that says, you know, safe handling instructions, keep frozen, thaw when you're ready, that sort of thing. So you can sell our baked as long as they are frozen. Frozen and have the label on them. But you cannot sell stuff that is not even par baked. The so raw yeah. dough, they don't recommend it. Again, this is black, not red, and they don't recommend it. But there is nothing in the law that says you can't. Not something you want to advertise on Facebook. Right, not something you want to advertise on Facebook. And remember, every time you're doing that, you are opening yourself up to some big risk and liability. Okay, not recommended for sale. Again, this is just guidance, but they don't recommend. Low acid or non-acidified home canned foods processed by either boiling water bath or home pressure canner, unless the pH is reduced to an equilibrium or a pH of 4.6 or less and verified using a calibrated pH meter. Those foods would include beans of any kind, excuse me, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, eggplant, horseradish, potatoes, mushroom, peppers, potatoes, spinach squash, any of those things. If you're going to sell them, can, from, as a cottage food operator, remember this is black, not red. 
So when somebody walks into your farmer's market and they have the canned potatoes, there's nothing in the law that says they can't do that. But guidance-wise, what we're saying, it's not a great idea unless the pH of that product has been brought down somehow. Okay, so how do we know that? Um, I want to go to one more. There we go. Okay, I'll go back up to those others. Here in North Dakota, all of these counties, their county extension agents have calibrated pH meters and people that know how to use them. So if you don't want to invest in your own pH meter, you just want to take one in and take a jar in and test it, um, they have a pH meter at any of those county extension offices and can help you test your product to know that the pH is less than 4.6. If it's something that you do a lot of, you may want to invest in your own pH meter. It's going to cost you anywhere from $35 to $75 depending on how you know, how uh, special, how intricate of one you get, right? This one I bought cost me 60, 60 bucks. But I think if I were using it a lot, it's also was something I did all the time, or um, pickled green beans was something I did all the time, that 60 bucks would really be worth it. Um, basically, really easy to use. Uh, each of them comes with their own instructions. But when you order one, if you do order one, you're also going to want to order a buffering solution. And you're going to want to order a buffering solution of either four or seven. Or the, both. Or both, exactly, or both. Because what that does is help you calibrate your instrument before you stick it into your product to know that it's, it's on, you know, we've all stepped on that, that uh, bathroom scale and had it go, a certain number and then we go to the doctor and the doctor says we, we weigh 10 pounds more, <laughs> right? It's never 10 pounds less, it's always 10 pounds more. Um, so you want to calibrate it using those buffer solutions. So as long as you're ordering um, a, a pH meter, order the buffer solutions as well, right off the bat. Um, how you basically would use it is um, calibrate your um, meter first. Then you will take your, your pickles or your salsa or whatever you're going to um, test. You're going to put them in a food processor, little, big, doesn't matter. And you're going to run them until you have a slurry, right? Until it's, it's all mashed up. Then you're going to strain that slurry off into a nice clean container. And then you will use your meter to test that slurry. Um, you want it at, as we said, 4.6 or less. At that point, 4.6 is where our microorganisms don't live so well. They don't like that area. They don't like that pH. Um, I have just, a question. Yes. Home can uh, pickles. How long do you wait before you test? I let them cool off at least. Yes. I mean, it, they. The length of time, you know, because to really have good flavor, sometimes we let them sit for a week or 30 days or whatever. Um, that is a flavor thing, not a pH thing. Okay. It's not going to change the pH. Great question. So if I have some pickles that I did last fall, I could test the pH on them now and it would be what it was? Yes, exactly. Okay. That's the beauty of, of canning and sealing and making that in a closed environment. We're still not recommending um, items that need to be pressure canned in the guidance. Remember, they are legal, but guidance-wise, we're still not recommending those. Why? Um, because pressure cookers vary greatly in the amount of pressure that they provide, the time, all of that. And once they've gone through that process, um, it also depends on what you have in there. A potato is a lot more dense than a green bean, right? Um, and you really have no way of knowing. So how can you know when you buy potatoes, canned potatoes on the shelf at the grocery store that they're safe? Because they have far more elaborate processes that they go through to ensure that that is a safe product than, than we can do safely at home. Allowed? Not recommended. Pretty much if it's a water bath, um, if you're in your standard recipe, it's a water bath, 
and it has a pH of 4.6 or less, you're, you're pretty good. So if it's pickled, you've add, added lemon juice, you've added vinegar, something to bring that pH down, um, you're safe. Okay, meat products, dairy products, not allowed. Um, dairy is still not part of this law. Raw milk is still not part of this law. However, I remember, right? What did I do with my law? There it is. What's it say? I'm processing how many is it? It doesn't say anything. It says raw milk is not allowed, but it doesn't say anything about cheese, if I remember right. I had that question too. I have another question. What about powdered milk? You're making your own powdered milk? No. Like if you would buy a powdered milk at the store. That's and fine. That's fine. And then what I'm thinking is a gluten-free substitute, a uh, cream soup substitute that has powdered milk in it that I've bought from a store. Right, and that's fine. Um, so that product that you're going to sell is going to be a powdered product they home, yes. home and mix up. Okay, um, back a couple slides. Remember it said dried goods, mm -hmm. um, baking mixes, so all of those things were fine. Because when we think about those items, they're not time and temperature control sensitive. Right. You're, you're good, you're fine. Okay. And yes, you can purchase items to put into that, that's fine. Um, but I was just checking the cheese again. Delivery. Transactions, transactions, processed food, animal health, yep, it doesn't say anything about cheese. <laughs> so if somebody wants to make their own cheese, it, it's now allowed. High risk, not recommended for sale. Um, Cheese, butter, yogurt. There's our butters. Okay. Cut fresh vegetables. Again, it's not the law. It's just recommended. Plant food uh, that is cooked vegetable products such as salads, broths, soups, things like that. A vegetable soup, say. Not recommended, but still not illegal. Raw seed sprouts, garlic, vegetable, or herb based oil mixes. Again, not against the law. Just not recommended. Um, other cottage food products that are approved for sale. Farm flock eggs, go ahead and sell them. That's okay. Do they have to be candled? They do not have to be candled. Um, they have to be refrigerated. They do not have to be refrigerated. In they the, don't have to be refrigerated? Not in the new law. But once they're refrigerated, aren't they supposed to be refrigerated? They are. But the new guidance, the new, exactly, that's guidance, not law. The new law does not specify. They encourage you to work with the Department of Agriculture and, be, and get an inspected flock. And if you are inspected, um, then yes, you need to candle them and you need to use new containers and you need to keep them cold if you are inspected. However, inspected um, is inspection is voluntary. Inspection and registration with the Department of Agriculture is voluntary. So um, you don't have to go through all that to sell your eggs. The, the step up that it does give you, however, is um, if you are inspected, and so you're candling and keeping them cold and using clean containers and all of that, you then could sell your eggs to a restaurant. You could sell your eggs to a bakery. You could sell your eggs to one of those retail food establishments where if you are not inspected and you're not following those things, you are limited to direct to consumer, which um, kind of puts an end to a lot of people used to send 20 dozen eggs with the neighbor in town when they went to work to put in a little fridge at the car dealership, right? Can't do that anymore because you as the owner of that flock are not personally there to take the money from that informed end consumer, okay? 
then you would have to have an inspected flock. If you had an inspected flock, a voluntarily inspected flock, and you're candling and doing all that, then you can do that. Are there any questions? Okay. Poultry needs to be whole, um, raw, and frozen. You can go up to 1,000 birds per year. And if you do that, then you are exempt from state and federal poultry regulations by the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. Um, one more thing to remember, and we, we, we did talk about this, is um, tax. If you are selling something and it could be considered ready to eat, that single slice of pie that you serve with a napkin and a fork, that's ready to eat, it's taxable, all right? If you put eating utensils with it and they can eat it right there, that's taxable. Okay, I have a question. Uh, what about these people that sell <coughs> cookies then that are already in babies and stuff? Is that taxed? Or is that something that we can... It's really a gray area. It really is. Um, and I really should go back and shut the camera off before I say that. <laughs> Just delete it. Yeah, there you go. I didn't know. Um, don't sell it with a napkin. That would be my suggestion. Because there's Kay. others that sell like um, popcorn, like, and that's popcorn. Uh, popcorn is ready to eat as far as I'm concerned. No. But you know, do we tax it because they could take it home and eat it later? Right. Trail mix. Exactly. When exactly when when we go, let's walk down to the convenience store down here and buy some. Popcorn from that place here in town that you can't pronounce the name. Whatever. Okay. And see if they tax us. They do. They do tax that popcorn? I'm quite sure they do. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure either. I, that, that's why I said we're going to have to test that one out. Um, but, you know, some of those things like cookies, real gray areas. Um, I. If, if I were the person selling them, I would not sell them with a napkin, and I would say the intent of my sale is for them to take them home and eat them. Because if you want to look at it that way, um, we have a couple of producers at the Minot market that, like myself, do the little um, pea cherry tomatoes that are teeny tiny. Mm -hmm. they, they sell them in a cup for a buck or two. And you see kids walking around the market just munching on those little buggers, right? Well. Or, or raspberries, right? right? They could be ready to eat. Okay, best practices for home canned items. We mentioned pH of 4.6 or less. That usually any pickles, salsas, flavored vinegars, all naturally fermented foods such as sauerkraut, all of those things I normally usually have a pH of 4.6 or less, but um, we, we want to test them and be sure. We talked about that one. Allergens, again, not part of the law, but just good food safety thinking is um, here's your eight major allergens. Um, it wouldn't hurt to put a little sticker on there that says um, this was made in a home where we may have been eating tree nuts and shellfish. Or this product contains eggs. At our market in Kandu, we require mm -hmm. that be put on. Yeah. All it's, of our baby stuff. And, and that's a great idea. It really is. In fact, um, last weekend when I was in Fargo doing this workshop, had a, a really wonderful gal there um, that had some great suggestions and ideas. And one of hers is, uh, she did a lot of baked goods for their farmer's market. And what she did is, she had a, she had a process. And she would start with, with all the baked goods that didn't have any of these things. And then she'd clean up the kitchen and then she would do, you know, the things that maybe had nuts in them. And we were gonna do the brownies with the nuts in them. And then she'd clean up those dishes and then she'd move, you know, so that as she moved into the, the um, allergen areas, she knew that she was cleaning between each time. I thought that was a great idea. I know when I do the nut-free, uh, or the gluten-free, my whole kitchen has to be cleaned down yep. before I start that process. Exactly, and that's what's called a clean break, and that's a, a fabulous thing to have done. And I usually set a day 
if I have a customer that wants that, I set the day aside just for that yep. product. That's it makes it a lot easier for me. Yeah. And that's what she was saying too. That's what she was saying too. You know, is is you know, she kinda had it arranged so that, you know, here was the gluten ones first and you know, as she moved into areas where there were more allergies, things with nuts, things with eggs, things with milk, things with wheat. Um, she always had that clean break in between, like you. So something to keep in mind is those allergies. Um, all of this comes down to this. This is what the customer sees. You know, that, that beautiful farmer's market, everything is lined up, everything's clean, all those wonderful clean totes, we've got our nice jars of jams and jellies, and we've got the signs there and everything. But what we don't see is what went on at home in the kitchen. You know, where the cat is walking across the counter and the meat and the vegetables are sharing a, a cutting board. And um, yeah, you know, we don't see what goes on at home. All we as consumers see is this. And that's why this whole cottage food thing comes down to informed and consumer. They want that person that is buying that product to be able to look you in the eye and if they have a question and say, did you let the cat walk across the counter at home? Um, or, or whatever their question is, they want that person to have the opportunity to ask the question so that they are informed, truly informed. 